Created by fire and titanic upheavals of the Earth, islands make up one-sixth of the landmass of our planet. They are lenses through which to study the complex workings of evolution. Tropical islands have been important in the understanding of evolution ever since Charles Darwin visited the Galapagos early in the 19th century. We are going to visit three very different tropical islands to see what they can tell us about evolution, even today. Islands are the natural world's testing grounds, full of novel experiments in natural selection and evolutionary wonders. But there's much more to evolution than the survival of the fittest. The phrase wasn't even in Darwin's first edition of The Origin of Species. I'm exploring other major influences, geology, geography, Hello. isolation, and time. You found this in giant spoons. I'll be charting the life cycle of islands, from birth and colonization to the burst of evolutionary creativity that often accompanies maturity. They take the leaves so delicately. And what eventually happens when an island grows old and nears its end. You can almost feel this unforgiving rock return ultimately to sea level. Places of extinction as well as creation. Our story will reveal evolution in action. We just discovered new species of the mosquitoes. So mouse feeders are still actively evolving. Yeah. And how life generates abundance even from a blank slate. Islands are the ideal place to understand the rules that govern evolution. In this first episode of the series, I want to investigate how animals and plants colonize and evolve on a newborn island. The remote Pacific island of Hawaii is home to creatures as unusual as carnivorous caterpillars, as hardy as volcano-adapted plants, and acid-resistant shrimps, and as exquisitely adapted to their environment as nectar-feeding honeycreepers. Here, too, is the secret of how one lucky species can transform into many. A new island is a new opportunity for life. An oceanic island is a kind of natural laboratory where we can see evolution playing out. It's the place to understand the rules that might govern the origin of new species. 2,400 miles from the nearest continental landmass, Hawaii is the most isolated group of islands in the world. Its eight major islands are all volcanic, and none of them are more than five million years old, making them geological infants, many millions, even billions of years younger than the continents. Hawaii, everything is volcanic, everything is lava. Even the sand is made of tiny little bits of broken up lava. This is the kind of place that arises from the sea due to volcanic activity and creates a tabula rasa for evolution. Before life of any kind can exploit such opportunities, it must first face one of the greatest challenges in nature. How does an animal or plant reach a newly erupted volcanic island? Very few organisms have learned the trick, but one that has the coconut. Its large fruits are covered with a buoyant coat, and inside there's a nut with lots of nourishment in it, and indeed some flotation because of air. On ocean currents, they can be carried huge distances. And when they land on a sandy beach, almost anywhere, they can germinate. 
their plentiful supply of nutrition means that a strong shoot can put down roots. As a result, sometimes it's thought with man's help, they have colonized virtually all the tropical waters of the Pacific. The coconut palm has learned the trick of wide dispersal. But for almost all other organisms, it's much more sporadic, much more chancy, much more difficult. Water is an obvious route to virgin land for those plants and animals adapted to it. Bravely battling the currents to feed on the algae that cling to the underwater rocks, turtles haul themselves on land to bask most mornings. One of the first animals to have arrived on a new volcanic island like this would have been a seagoing turtle. They would have loved to come in, bask in the sun, and lay their eggs on the sandy shores, especially if there were no natural predators. Even so, the Hawaiian form of the green turtle is often regarded as a special subspecies endemic to the island. Green turtles are found all over the Pacific, but on Hawaii, they become endemic, a word derived from the ancient Greek meaning native. Long isolated from others of their kind, through natural selection, each new generation has become increasingly better adapted to the local environment. Turtles evolve very slowly, but one day Hawaiian green turtles may be so genetically different from others of their kind, they will no longer be able to breed with them. They will have become a new species. This process is not always so slow. In fact, on the isolation of an island, some plants and animals can rapidly evolve into not just one, but many new species. Scientists call this adaptive radiation. And one of the best examples of it anywhere in the world is found on the Hawaiian island of Maui. Here live numerous species of Hawaii's rare honey creepers. And among those most exquisite adaptations is the shape of the bill. This is exactly what Darwin observed at the very cradle of the idea of evolution in the Galapagos Islands. Another group of finches, another group of modifications to bill form in adaptation to mode of life. The first finches arrived on Hawaii five million years ago and quickly radiated and adapted into five distinct lifestyles. Insect picking gleaners, generalists, long beaked nectar eaters, seed lovers, and parrot beaked bark pickers. But each of these different lifestyles has spawned multiple species. The total tally of these endemic birds once exceeded 50. Hoping to glimpse one of Hawaii's iconic honey creepers for myself, I join Hannah Mounts of the Maui Forest Bird Recovery Project. More than a mile above sea level, Hannah takes me on a long hike to reach a high belt of surviving native forest. After a long trek, we reach our destination. And it's full of evergreen ohia lahua trees. Now it's a sort of subtle bird song. Yeah, you can definitely hear them now. We're hearing three right now. Yeah, you can hear Apopani, Eevee, and Maui all the way here. I suppose they're feeding on, on nectar if they can find it. Yeah, so they're following mainly the um, Ohia Lehua blooms, um, but because there's not very many flowers right now, they're also feeding on a lot of insects. To get a closer look, we first set up mist nets. Mm. 
By alternating pre-recorded Honey Creeper calls from speakers positioned to either side of the nets, with luck, Hannah and her colleague Chris will lure down these very rare and notoriously shy birds to tag them. The first honey creeper to get snagged is an insect eater. So what's this guy called? Uh, Maui Alawahio. Its English name is the Maui creeper, which is much easier. The Maui creeper. Is it endemic to Maui? Endemic to Maui. Efficient. Cute. Okay. So we have virtually exactly 30 grams. Perfect. So this is an absolutely charming small honey creeper, an insectivore, I guess. Yes, and it is endemic to Maui Island. Okay, so I'm going to slip him back into there, and then I'm just going to make sure his head is up at the top. Yeah. Perfect. Is that all right? Yep. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, this is an adult male. He's at least two years old. We can tell that by his real yellow plumage. The oldest honey creepers that we've found in this forest are, you know, 15 to 17 that's, years old. That's old for a small bird, isn't it? For a 13 gram bird, that's pretty old. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, does it have other anatomical adaptations for forest life? It does. Um, creepers aren't very good flyers, so they have short rounded wings and they can really hop between trees and kind of work their way through the forest and they're really adapted for the understory of the native forest. You see them um, upside down and sideways and everywhere trying to creep along the branches in order to uh, okay. chase the inverts and bugs and moths and things. Just a slight deflection on the bill. So how does this little bird fit into the great radiation of the honey creepers on the Hawaiian Islands? It's uh, one of the older honey creepers diverged very early. All the different bill specializations in honey creepers are quite amazing, and unfortunately we've lost the most specialized of the birds that we had. A lot of the honey creepers that have not gone extinct, you know, are the more generalists because they were able to hold on in changing habitats. Further down the mountainside, another set of nets has snared Maui's rarest honey creeper. The kiwi kiu, or Maui parrot bill, uses its specialized bill to dig out grubs from beneath tree bark. Um, so there she is. Maui parrot bill. She's pretty adorable. There, you can see how she uses that bill on my finger. Yeah. Does it hurt? Oh, a little bit, not too bad. <laughs> So, and this is specialized for ohia trees, presumably? Um, ohia and koa, but specialized for the native forests. So he uses the bill like a chisel and can really have a lot of control over that lower mandible and dig out wood and bark, kind of like a continental woodpecker would. And this is really, really rare. These are the most endangered birds on Maui, um, and one of the most endangered in all of Hawaii. There are only about 500 in existence. These guys are very long-lived. Uh, they only have one chick per year. Chick stays with its parents for sometimes a year. So they're very rare, very slow reproducing. Well, perhaps we should let her have some peace. The third and final honey creeper the net snag is called the Hawaiian Amakihi. Its long, thin bill has evolved to help it feed on nectar. The ancestors of today's honey creepers were finches that were probably blown off course during their annual migration. Genetic studies suggest they made an incredible 6,000 mile journey across open ocean all the way from Central Asia. The early bird gets the worm, or in this case, inherits the island. And this same extraordinary story of a single founder leading to an adaptive radiation has happened again and again on Hawaii. My next stop is the protected rainforest of the neighboring island of Oahu. 
I'm off to see another species whose ancestors were also blown to Hawaii on the wind. But this one is a plant. A member of Hawaii's Park Service guides me to a location where an endangered member of this radiation is being reintroduced to the wild. Chipper Witchman, president of Hawaii's National Tropical Botanical Gardens, is on hand to tell me its biography. And here we are in your natural habitat. Their oldest ancestor arrived here, dispersed here by wind. It's just a, a phenomenal event. So what are the chances of that happening? Well, think about this. We, we're the most geographically isolated group of islands anywhere in the world, thousands of miles from any continental area. And I once had a professor who talked about, you know, the, what is the chance of something actually dispersing here by wind? blowing through the wind and landing on these islands, reproducing itself. He said the chance of that is very, 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 very improbable. He said, really, what does that boil down to? Give it enough time, it's guaranteed to happen. The plant in question is a specialist lobelioid that has co-evolved with the honey creepers. So let me show you one of my friends here. This is a cyania. This is cyania crispa and it's flowering right now. Well, it's, it's a really wonderful-looking flower. Yes. Here you can see the curved corolla and, and how this curved shape co-evolved with the curved beak of the, of the honey creepers, provided a little nectar reward for the bird. And in return, it would, it would get the pollen from the male parts of this flower, from the anthers here. So the bird would get the pollen on its head as it got its nectar reward. It would go on and would carry it to another, to another flower and was a very effective pollinator. And then afterwards the fruit? And then comes back when the seeds are mature to eat the fruit. So this species evolved a fleshy fruit that was then eaten by the birds and dispersed through other parts of the island, adapting from being a wind-dispersed ancestor to being a fleshy fruit that could be dispersed by birds was one of its strategies for exploiting the many, many niches that are available in the Hawaiian Islands. So different species for different altitudes. Absolutely. Presumably. And yeah. different habits as well, some shrubby, some tree-like? Some arbor arborescent ones, some shrubby ones, some vegetative ones. And it's just, so it's, I mean, the story of evolution in this, in this tribe of, of lobelioids is, is simply amazing. This lobelioid is just one of 126 species endemic to Hawaii. All of them descended from one ancestral species. Sometimes called the founder effect, it's another story that highlights the rich evolutionary rewards of being the first to arrive on a remote island. The founder effect helps explain how Hawaii, at just 0.2% of the size of the continental United States, nonetheless contains nearly 15% of all US species. Another all important factor is Hawaii's sheer ecological variety. No other island group in the world goes from cold, desolate mountaintops to dense, wet forest and tropical beaches in the space of only a few miles. It's the sort of place where almost anything can find a niche to thrive, if it can get here. One species that was carried here on wing and wind is the fruit fly, Drosophila. Once alighted, the founding species took adaptive radiation to extremes. Astonishingly, genetic analysis has revealed that all 600 modern species of Hawaiian Drosophila are descended from a single pregnant female that arrived here more than five million years ago. Someone who gets a buzz out of flies is entomologist Dr. Steve Montgomery. So, Steve, we have before us a mere four files containing flies. I noticed nicely patterned wings. They are spots that help the females recognize males of their own species. So what about this guy? Well, Drosophila sylvestris, it lives in the, in the forest of the Big Island of Hawaii, and only that island, and they, they like lobelia plants. This guy, a narrow triangular shape, rather different. That would be Drosophila grimshaw. 
and it seems to be the most polyphagous. It, it, it has a wide choice of food plants, so the female will, will select a, a archaea plant, which has a lot of toxic chemicals. Most flies won't even touch it. And last, but certainly not least, Heteronura. It's the only species in the Hawaiian Islands which has a hammerhead. Only in the males, and it's used in a uh, competition on the lex to dominate. So it's one of those head-to-head -head, head fights, is it? So you get uh, much like the rams uh, yeah. and the sheep species will do, where when a female is ready to find a, a mate, she will come by there, and, and the, the last, last one standing is the one that gets to make her an offer. A vast abundance of fruit flies on Hawaii created the ideal opportunity for a fly-eating insect to thrive. But Hawaii had none until another ancestor was also blown here by the wind. A caterpillar normally eats shoots and leaves. This one has disguised itself as a twig as this unsuspecting fly approaches. The ultimate endemic, the Hawaiian carnivorous caterpillar. After their arrival on these islands, an abundance of fruit flies offered them an unprecedented opportunity to swap vegetarianism for a more nutritious, protein-based diet. Steve was the scientist who first discovered this bizarrely modified inchworm caterpillar. So you actually made this discovery yourself? Of the yes, uh, I was curious enough to uh, bring it back and, and offer it some of the thousands of flies in our lab, and people couldn't believe it when I told them they had an ambushing inchworm. Now, is that, that unique to Hawaii? This behavior is indeed unique. It evolved in Hawaii, and it, it worked in Hawaii because there weren't any praying mantises or mantis fish or other raptorial predators, so an unlikely candidate like an inchworm could occupy the carnivory niche. So we have 18 species of ambushing inchworms. That's quite a mini radiation, isn't it? All of its own. Well, when they crossed that adaptive zone, they, they uh, exploded into every island, uh, has at least four or five species. So we've a story we've met before. That the opportunities are available, and they left the flowers, or, or in addition to the flowers, they added on live prey to their diet. And through changes in behavior, bit by bit, it became an obligate predator. They, they'd rather starve than they switch back to a vegetarian diet. It can wait six weeks between meals, and this is a large meal. I won't have to feed it for another month. Of the 18 species of carnivorous caterpillars, more than half have evolved to become obligate predators. In other words, they have specialized to such a degree, there's no turning back. So when one of these gets hungry, it would rather eat its own kind than a plant. But being a caterpillar of any kind, let alone a fruit fly, provides opportunities for further colonists to make a good living. Today, they can be found all over the Hawaiian Islands. Spiders. The one I hope to examine today is often found high up in the canopy, where one of a team from the University of Hawaii at Hilo on the big island, Brendan Coate, is searching. Down below, his colleague, Ellie Armstrong, is checking the leaf litter and lower branches, because in Hawaii's native forests, spiders have adapted to live almost everywhere. It might not look like a giant, but many of this spider's relatives are barely visible to the human eye, making this moth hunter a relative colossus. So this is Orson Welles. That's its real Latin real scientific Latin name, name, is it? Yes, yes. So this guy is in the family Linotheidae. Um, and generally, Linotheids are actually quite small sheet web spiders. So they'll... Ah, well, I mean, that doesn't look like a particular giant to me. Presumably, it was this name because Orson Welles was known both for his, what should we say, stature in yeah. intellectual in other directions. <laughs> sure, stature and charisma, maybe. Right, okay, well, it's charismatic. Right. So this is a giant among its kind. It is, yeah. This is probably the biggest um, spider in the family Linotheidae. They're normally really, really tiny sheet web spiders. 
So although this is an interesting thing about island gigantism, we tend to think that means the thing is the size of a fo football or bigger. But of course, <laughs> if you start very, very small, this is still a giant. Yes, relatively. It's relatively large, I should say. This giant may be the big-name star, but another endemic Hawaiian spider has evolved to steal the show from right under Orson Welles' mandibles. So this guy is Ariamnes, um, and as you can see, uh, it's really brilliantly gold. What's interesting about these guys is some of them are kleptoparasites. Not, means, yes. Some of them will actually go in other spiders' webs and, and steal their oh, prey. Oh, yes, the, 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 the shoplifting ones. Yes, exactly. Klepto, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, so kleptoparasitic, yes. yeah. Even though he seems a little clumsy, he's very sneaky. Ellie and her team still don't know how many spiders live on the Big Island. It could be many hundreds. So, Ellie, how do spiders manage to get to a remote place like the Hawaiian chain in the first place? So, spiders can disperse amazing distances um, across thousands of miles of the ocean. And what they generally do is the spinnerets on the end of their abdomen, they release silk, and then the silk will create a balloon that the wind can then catch and disperse the spider across to these really remote island chains like Hawaii. But some larger insects, like moths, possibly used a different trick to make the 2,000-odd mile journey from either Asia or America. In fact, they may have used stepping stones to get down to the tectonic truth of how an island's geology determines its evolutionary destiny. I'm bound for Pu'u O'o, an erupting volcanic vent. We're coming toward the summit, and, and you can see the smoke. This is what the creative process looks like. And I can see through the clouds the, the lava lake. It's a sort of orange from here, but of course it's unbelievably hot liquid magma, liquid rock itself, where the lava is coming up from deep, deep plumbing into the mantle, the very birth of new land. It spews more or less continuously. The light is catching fresh lava so that you can see the tongues feeling their way to the low ground. Pu'u O'o is the latest outlet for a massive outpouring of lava from deep beneath the Earth's crust that is still making the big island bigger. On the lip of the giant Kilauea caldera, I meet Don Swanson of the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. At the present day, the big island, Hawaii itself, is the youngest and therefore the largest of these volcanic islands. It's still active. Yes. There's ev abundant evidence of that. Yes. And still growing. And still growing. Uh, the volcano has been uh, growing every time that lava goes into the sea. What's also forgotten, though, is that the island is growing up. Every time that a lava flow erupts under the surface, even if it doesn't expand the island, it is building higher. But a volcanic island doesn't grow indefinitely. One day, it will stop spewing lava and start sinking back into the sea. This life cycle is tied to its geological position on the Earth's shifting tectonic plates. So how does that work, Don? How does that work from a perspective of the way geology is in control of an island's fate? There's a, a, a zone in the mantle that is hot enough for rocks to actually melt. That's many kilometers down, uh, many kil uh, Probably about 100 kilometers or so down. And then this has to be rising into a plate of the Earth's crust that is moving across that hot spot. When that, when that magma reaches the top of the plate, it erupts to form a volcano. But now the, vo the plate is continuing to move, 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 and so its, it's, co its connection with the plume carrying the magma is more and more tenuous, and eventually it snaps. Then a new volcano forms, and then you go through the same process again. So this movement of the plate toward the northwest creates, vo over the hot spot, creates volcanoes after volcanoes after volcanoes, and that's been going on for 70 million years or so. 
and uh, th those islands must have had life on them, and they probably probably life moved then down the chain to the younger islands as the older ones sank. Starting on the coast of Siberia, we can track the now vanished volcanic islands created by the hotspot using undersea bathymetric data. As we move east, we trace millions of years of history past the sunken remains of ancient islands to atolls and reefs just beneath the surface, all the way to the hotspot's current position beneath the big island. By hopping from one island to the next, a handful of founders spawned more than 10,000 modern species of terrestrial invertebrates. Other arrivals produce some descendants capable of rising to the greatest environmental challenges. Hawaii's most extreme conditions are found above the cloud line. On the highest part of the island of Maui lies the spectacular Haleakala National Park. Its volcanic cinder slopes are parched and almost completely devoid of life. Yet one species has adapted to living conditions of 25% less oxygen, 50% more harmful ultraviolet light, and temperatures that regularly plummet to zero. It's a distant relative of the humble daisy. Its hundreds of delicate roots gather nutrients for years before a single burst of reproductive brilliance. Though I'm rather surprised to find it living in the summit car park. Ten thousand feet up on top of a volcanic mountain in Hawaii lives a very special plant, the silver sword. This is its earlier stage, it's a rosette stage, a tight bunch of leaves, and on each leaf, silver hairs. And they serve both to reflect the sunlight and to prevent water loss. This plant lives in really extreme conditions. It's biding its time. The rosettes get larger and larger, saving up energy. And then they erupt into a flowering spike, having saved up enough energy to produce an enormous number of flowers. This plant has just finished flowering and it reveals the true biological affinities of this extraordinary plant. It's related to the daisy, or the sunflower family. A huge island giant, if you like, produces tens of thousands of seeds from a single plant. When it's flowered, it dies. <laughs> This sad remnant is all that remains behind of the silver sword. It's dead. At the opposite end of the altitude scale, a remarkable species lives in the extreme conditions created by recent volcanism. Few creatures tolerate living in the acidic water of volcanic rock pools, but every challenge is a potential adaptation. One that rises to it is hidden in the tiny crevices of this porous rock. It's a diminutive shrimp. At the Waikiki Aquarium in Honolulu, the director, Dr. Andy Rossiter, has been studying specimens gathered from a variety of different rock pools. One ad adaptation is the very small size. That is actually the adult size. It's probably about, uh, is that about half a centimeter, five millimeters? So they are a shrimpy shrimp. They're a shrimpy shrimp, yeah. I noticed that all the jars have different figures for acidity. And 
most of those are all rather acid. Yes. So is that another adaptation? That's another adaptation. They're called acidophilic, which means they like or can tolerate high acidity. Descended from ocean-going shrimps, the Hawaiian red shrimp has evolved to survive entirely in volcanic rock pools. These appendages look not unlike those of a normal shrimp. Correct, it's just the basic shrimp plan, but the thing to notice are the, the large eggs. There are, oh, that's on the back. Yes, the maximum in this species is about 20, so very few large eggs. Which, for a crustacean, is a very small number. Very, very low number. When the larvae hatch, they, are, they themselves are large, and the larvae have a yolk sac, which means they don't have to disperse. They can essentially stay in or near the habitat where they hatched. Because red shrimps have evolved, never needing to leave their home pools, there's no genetic exchange between different populations. And this is prompting them to evolve into new species. Some of the populations have bright, bright red shrimps. Others have clear with no red at all, and others have red and white bands. Research has been done about on their genetics to see how closely related they are. And there are eight separate populations within the entire Hawaiian Islands. So would it be an exaggeration to say that these are eight species that are kind of in the making? Absolutely. In the making? They, they differ by about 5% in terms of mitochondrial DNA. Just to put it into perspective, humans and chimpanzees are 98% similar. These guys are 95% similar. This is how speciation begins. Isolated from others of their kind, the red shrimp is separating into as many as eight new species, each adapted to the very specific conditions of their own homes. But it's a two-way process. Geology may divide populations, but other species can transform the volcanic rocks themselves. This is a fern, a tree fern, and here it is growing in naked lava. But ferns have minute seeds, spores. They're so tiny they can be brought in on the wind. If they can find a place in the tiniest crack, they'll grow, they'll germinate. And that's a terribly important thing because they begin to make soil. Over time, much of this harsh lava will be broken up by ferns and bacteria and turned into earth. Ferns are found all over the world but Hawaii has evolved its own specialist soil-making tree, the Ohia Lehua. This is a small Ohia tree that's taken root in, well, still quite bare lava. It's already flowering with these beautiful red flowers. Given time, not a huge amount of time, it will turn into lush forest. A lush, tropical island, populated by numerous plants and many small invertebrates, is a habitat that can potentially support larger animals. One of the largest arrived by accident more than half a million years ago. Today, it seems determined to lead me around the houses. This is the Nene. It's a very handsome goose and another Hawaiian endemic. It's actually very closely related to the Canada goose. It's a little bit smaller, but their skeletons are apparently almost identical. You can imagine a Canada goose getting severely blown off course. The survival of the Nene owes quite a lot to Great Britain. When the population has shrunk to just a few pairs, some of them were transferred by Sir Peter Scott to the Wildfowl Centre at, at Slimbridge. And there they were bred on until the population had increased to the point where they could be reintroduced into the wild. Since then, they've done very well. And there they're thriving. It's a success story. The Nene's ancestors were strong flyers. But now, like many island birds, its wings have grown weak and can barely carry it between the Hawaiian islands. Flightless birds were once common on Hawaii, and in Honolulu's Bishop Museum, they have one of the largest that ever lived here. 
we're going to look at one of the extinct giants of the Hawaiian Islands. And Molly Hagerman, here in the Bishop Museum, is going to show me. So this is a uh, Moanalo, which is an extinct goose-like duck. Uh, so one of, the, one of the main features is the sternum is completely smooth. So that's the sternum. Correct. And so on a bird that can fly, this is from a nene, so, and this is um, contemporary. So you can see the difference in size, and obviously the one feature that's missing from that is the, the large keel. It's what we call on the chicken a breastbone. Exactly, yeah. So this is where all the flight muscles would attach. So this lost flight, well, no predators, presumably. Exactly. It didn't need to invest that energy into uh, a keel and flight muscles. And instead, it redirected those resources to produce more robust limb bones. So that's a limb bone. Mm-hmm. So this is, this is from a nene, so yeah. a contemporary bird. I don't have to be a particularly perceptive right. scientist to see that that one is three times as robust as that one. Exactly. So here we have the idea that if you don't use something, in this case flight muscles, then you tend to lose it. Exactly. Three million years ago, um, something similar to a mallard would have colonized the Hawaiian Islands and then rapidly changed into what we see here. A ground-dwelling large duck. So who let them up? Well, probably the, the Polynesians that colonized Hawaii, because they were probably slow moving. Um, they were large. They were they probably tasted pretty good. It's a kind of it's a bit like a Hawaiian dodo, except the dodo we know was derived from the pigeon mm -hmm. family, mm -hmm. and here's the duck family producing something else. Yep. The Moa Nalo fell victim to an invasive species. Man. Polynesians made Honolulu their capital in the 11th century, bringing with them livestock and introducing new crops. Hawaii was changed forever. Micropropagation laboratory of the Lion Arboretum is a modern day Noah's Ark. These test tubes contain more than a hundred species of critically endangered Hawaiian plants. The samples here share common vulnerabilities associated with island life. Descended from only one or just a few ancestors and long isolated, they have also become highly specialized. They are often outcompeted by new arrivals. Out in the greenhouse is a familiar plant that is being kept here for its own protection. Ah, this is the one I'm after. Even plants can lose protective characteristics in the safety of an island. And this looks like a mint. It is a mint, but it's a mintless mint. It's lost what it didn't need, which was the protective chemicals that protect most mints from being eaten by herbivores. It's the thing we like because it, it's delicious smell. And this one doesn't have any of those. It's not onto the trouble of making those chemicals anymore because it didn't need them. Well, it didn't need them in the past. It needs them now because, of course, pigs and sheep and other herbivorous animals have come in and decimated the wild population, which is why it's here among all the rare and protected plants. And of course, would be quite useless for flavouring your garden peas. By some estimates, before humans arrived, only one new species colonised Hawaii every 35,000 years. Once Europeans made contact, that number leapt to an average of one per month. For centuries, the Hawaiian Islands were unknown to Europeans, but all that changed when Captain Cook discovered the group. And by the time Cook made his third visit and prepared this map in 1779, it was with the latest technology of the time. Hawaii's place in the world was fixed forever. It was doomed to change. Within 10 years, missionaries were declaring it the new Eden, but it was already a fragile Eden. 
to get an idea of the sheer scale of new species that have arrived on Hawaii after Europeans made contact, I visit Manoa Falls, one of the most famous beauty spots in Hawaii. To help me see the proverbial wood from the invasive trees, I rejoin Chipper Witchman. So it's an extraordinary thought that this uh, whole forest has grown up in, what, 100 years or so? Uh, yeah, uh, this is probably everything you see here is, is 100 years or less. Well, I mean, to me, that pink flower looks like, somewhat like a banana. It, it is. It's a flowering banana. It was introduced, actually, as an you know, ornamental banana. But most of these plants were all brought here intentionally. With unintentional consequences. Absolutely. Well, that's a hell of a tree. The Albizia. It was actually brought intentionally to Hawaii in 1917 as a potential tree for reforestation in Hawaii. This, this particular tree right here is probably less than 50 years old. Good God. Uh, what else? Well, I can see a conifer there. Uh, don't so tell me that's another invader, is it? It, it? Well, we call it, instead of invasive species, a naturalized species. Okay. So it's, it's been able to establish itself independently. Um, it's a relative of the monkey puzzle. It's oh, an aerocaria. Yeah. yeah. Originally brought here by the sailing ship captains who, who wanted replacement mass for their ships. In a curious way, we've got a kind of world sample of we do. plants here. We do. Which is in, a, in one way wonderful, but in another way tragic. I'm not sure how to describe it. It might seem like the beautiful plants of Manoa Falls are harmless. And indeed, many non-native species cause little harm. But on a small island, even a single invasive pest can wreak havoc. Biologist Chris Warren shows me an innocent-looking Jackson's chameleon. So we've got a, a male here. The one that looks like Triceratops. Like a Triceratops, exactly. And a female, so she has no horns. And so presumably there's sexual selection working on... Yeah, well, males, as usual, are the horny ones. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> when did he and she arrive here in the wild? So they were, they were released as pets, inadvertently or inadvertently. Maybe sometime in the 1970s, they escape for whatever reasons, and then within a pretty short period of time, they are so abundant that it's, it's almost not feasible to remove them. Well, they're pretty little animals. Why should we be worried about what they do? They eat every invertebrate they find, including lots of rare, threatened, endangered insects. Hawaii doesn't have native reptiles. So just the just the marine ones, sea turtles yeah, and things. But so the but ter no terrestrial ones. So right. presumably these guys, what, they weren't expected, and there's nothing to prey on them. Exactly. Unfortunately, they have spread maybe as much as they're going to. Um, well, that's not just since the 1970s, so... Yes. Uh, that's a lot of damage in a short period of time. Mm hmm Geological time, it's nothing at all. <laughs> it's nothing, yes. But there are other invisible killers brought here by man. Mosquitoes arrived with European and American ships in the 1800s. They spread avian malaria to Hawaii's native honeycreepers, causing devastation. Today, most honeycreepers only survive where mosquitoes cannot, up at altitudes of several thousand feet. But remarkably, after two centuries of exposure to malaria, some species of honeycreepers have started to move down to lower elevations again. It seems they've evolved a resistance. And this is one of the fundamental rules of all evolution. It never stops. The beautiful Eo Valley on Maui is a sacred place to native Hawaiians. It's a good spot to ask how Hawaii's rich evolutionary diversity can be saved from extinction with conservation scientist Sam Gordon III. Well, you know, just as, just as there are endemic plants and animals here, there are also endemic cultures. And so Hawaii and Hawaiians were in this place um, from a thousand years ago. 
and uh, they existed here in 100% self-sufficiency um, with a remarkably small ecological footprint. And today, our self-sufficiency is down to 15%. Which means almost everything has to be bought in from outside. That's right. Which means, well, it's certainly not sustainable. No, if, we, if, if that influx of goods were to stop, in three weeks' time, we'd probably be eyeing each other hungrily, you know, and <laughs> things would be bad. Well, you're, you're not a man given to despair, are you? No, I, so, you have to be an optimist to be in conservation, I think. I think so, too. And uh, everywhere that I go, um, I see places that have, that have degraded from when I first saw them, but I also see places where with just a little bit of effort, keeping the non-native animals out and removing the most aggressive weeds, that the natives, given half a chance, will actually come back and thrive. Combining the wisdom of the past with the science of the present to reduce our ecological footprint seems like a good starting point for any conservationist. The question is, to what extent can a native Hawaiian diet sustain me? For a thousand years, Hawaiians were able to live off the land of Hawaii in a self-sufficient way. And this would have been a kind of rather typical repast. First of all, we have poi, which is made from the taro root. And it's a bit bland, and it's not unpleasant. And I'm told it's terribly nutritious. So much so that babies can be fed on it. The poi goes particularly well with the lao lao, and this is lao lao, and it's um, typically pork wrapped in taro leaves, cooked in hot stones, often buried for 12 hours while the stones do their work. So the pork is deliciously tender. Mmm, the taro leaves suffuses the meat as well, so it's really delicious. And the taro leaves themselves taste a bit like a slightly coarse spinach or chard. And for dessert, something prepared from the insides of a coconut. It's called halpia. It's a bit like a rather thick yogurt. Mmm, it's actually delicious. And I'm sure it's very good for you too. As for eating all this lot, well, if I could manage to finish it off, I'd probably suffer from something called kanak attack, which means a bad attack of wanting to have a long sleep um, before I could face any more food again. Volcanic islands like Hawaii and the species they generate live fast and die young. Most will be reclaimed by the sea after a few million years. But a few islands are almost immortal. In the next episode we visit Madagascar. Not a volcano, but a fragment of an ancient continent more than 90 million years old. And here, the vastness of time has created an extraordinary evolutionary wonderland. And Nature's Wonderland's Islands of Evolution is back at the same time next Monday. Stay with us now for original British drama here on BBC4. Work and family life collide for Charles Darwin as Paul Bettany and Jennifer Connolly star in tonight's movie, Creation, next. <laughs>